And welcome to the Chords Crash Cast Pod. I mean, yes. Crash Chords Podcast. Things. And stuff. Wait. Was that like one of those... No, he did not do that on purpose. Nope, interdimensional no, no. portals that like screws you up for like a few seconds, because I've seen a lot of Star Trek, and that happens. Next, you're going to tell me you think um, what's-his-name is actually real. The guy who always messes with reality in the next generation, I'm blanking on his name. Q, right? Oh, Q, yeah. yeah. You know this? I'm so impressed by you right now. Shut Turning me up. on. I like Star Trek. You know that. <laughs> That's the same extent, favorite. though. You're not, a, you're not like of the ilk. There are levels. No, there are not levels. No, there actually are levels. There are I don't, I don't levels. consider myself a Dislike? Trekkie. Dislike? I don't consider myself a Trekkie, but I know every episode of every series. Then you're a Trekkie. You're a Trekkie, dude. No, I don't collect anything. A, I don't you don't have to festivals. collect anything. No, no, no. I don't go to... I have no interest in signatures or anything like that. A Trekkie like does not need to collect things. A yeah. Trekkie just needs to be able to point out It's an obsessive wrong. knowledge of... Oh, yeah. But that's... No, that's not because I'm a Trekkie. That's because I'm a stubborn asshole. No, that also... Isn't an asshole, you're... Isn't asshole a curse? Aren't you going to have to beep it now twice? Yeah. I was hoping you wouldn't point that out. I should just... I your work, welcome. I'm going to start me. singing Family Reunion by, by Blink-182. Oh, please don't. It's got all seven of the dirty people. words. When will we be say. curseless? Ah. Anyway, um... Con! So... Just know us already. A uh, quick plug at the top. This week, the Wasties are playing at the Way Station for their monthly show on Thursday. Um, also... Last Tuesday, I saw Bare Naked Ladies. They played with uh, Guster and Ben Folds, and it was an excellent concert. And there was a neat dynamic that I wanted to talk to you about, Steve. So it was it was in Prospect Park, so it was a fairly big concert with a nice lawn. In the back of the lawn, there was, you know, merch tables and stuff. It's the band shell, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I saw a TV on the radio there a few years ago. Okay. So, while they were waiting for the show to start, Bare Naked Ladies played a tiny acoustic concert back by the merch tables. They played like four or five, uh, like six or seven songs. That's then, nice. They got fan service. Yeah. They? And then they, they, you know, and so then Guster went on stage. They were the first band. Then, um, then Ben Folds. Between Ben Folds and Bare Naked Ladies, Guster went to the back area and played a little mini concert and played like seven or eight songs. That's interesting. It was oh, neat. About the uh, Bare Naked Ladies, the, the lineup, how, what, was it mostly tracks from the new album? Um, obviously... They play. We might as well just mention it now. We didn't give them a great review for their so brand they, new album, so but they, they have a lot of good singles. So they do. They played the. They played four songs from the new record. They played uh, two of the ones that I liked. One, the one that you liked a lot, and then odds are they also played two songs that I didn't like from the album that were good live because they were a fan service. There yeah. was one that was very good for a sing along. The one that we said that was kind of kiddish. It was very conducive to sing along, and they did the whole thing. When we say this, you say that, and then the whole song was a sing along, which was fun. I mean, the song's well, still not great, that's but a it was live fun. Experience, and but but we'll talk a lot actually, more about the live experience later. What was really cool though was because I've been listening to Bare Naked Ladies a long time. I forgot about a couple songs that they played live, and I went, "Oh yeah, that song's really great." Like a song called "Old Apartment," which I'd completely forgotten about until they played it live at the show. Um, ben Folds, of course, put on a killer performance. And Guster was really great live. I'd never seen them live before, and I liked them a lot. And they put on a really good show. They actually had a lot more dancier songs than I thought they did. Because Guster was kind of like an alt-pop band. We'll, we'll get into live stuff we'll later, get more later, later in the later. episode. Indeed. Um, I have some news. I saw a... I can't call it a documentary. It's more of a collection of shorts uh, by, the, by a director called Philip Harder who has been working with... Sorry. Not not cool. Not cool. In any case, he's been working with the band Low, who we reviewed uh, with their most recent album in uh, episode 43. And, <laughs> yes, Don't I know me. episodes. Do, 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 do. It's, it's just funny. funny. It'll always yeah, be funny. Definitely 43. But yeah, Low has been around for a, a pretty long time. This is actually their 20th anniversary. They've okay. been around since uh, 1993. and 20 they started... years? Wow. Yeah, a long time. And they started out as this sort of grungish, slowcore band, 
And they didn't really have, like, it was hard to really define what they were at the time. But in many ways, they were defined by this director who started doing little shorts. And he, we actually had a Q&A, so we got to meet him afterwards That's and, great. like, talk to him. Um, and he mentioned that in the very beginning, Low, like, wh- what is the music video for Low going to be with their style, which was so grungy and so slow back in those days? And they came up with the idea, like, why don't we just do it black and white and we're on a boat trying to push through the ice? And that, of course, was the very, very first short in this entire movie. And they go through other things. And it's, it's, it's the kind of stuff that you only get if you're really listening to their early discography. Wait, wait, gotta, but it was I, very, very interesting stuff. I got, I Some got, of it is a little bit up there, high art, you know, okay. but I gotta, very interesting. I gotta ask you. Why don't we just do it in black and white, pushing a boat through the ice? Yeah. That's not at all pretentious? No, it's actually very simple. It is, actually. Okay. <laughs> you can't be pretentious when you're in the tundra. <laughs> it's kind of hard. It's just, no, this, this, that's, that's a very I'm... simple lifestyle. <laughs> well, I find that... Let's just push a boat through the ice. Before man. we get into Look this week's it. album, I find that bands like... Well, bands like <laughs> Low... I'll comment on that in a second. Bands like Low and some other bands that we've listened to that lean more towards art, like Flying Lotus and some others, I think lend to short film. Like, one of the favorite things we liked about... Flying Lotus, the one was, song that we all love. Was the loved, video I found. Was this the video, which was a nice little short film Honey that was Bunch animated. Yeah, and and you know, even for me, I, I grew up just knowing their... Well, I grew up. I had known college. But I, I, grew them for, I knew them for their music. So it was actually hard for me to put a video experience. But it added a whole new level to it sure. that I never saw before. So that's what was really fascinating about it. As for what you're saying, John, the funny thing about this is that Lowe, in many ways, didn't really have a vision of their own. It was... Philip Harder creating the vision for them okay. because Lowe writes the music and they kind of just like to feed their vision through the music, so to speak. But they were very non-objective to anything that Philip Harder did, and it was a very interesting thing that he came up with. In many ways, he defined their 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 whole style as being a very slow, relaxing band from Duluth, Minnesota. So you're gonna have uh, vibes like ice and things he, like that. He likes to plug Duluth, Minnesota too. It's a, you know, I, believe it or not, believe it or not. He's, every time he's ever said where they're from, it's always Duluth, Minnesota. Recently, like that band from recently, Duluth, Minnesota. John, yes. I did this thing, because I do little things here. I looked at every single band that we've reviewed, and I just, out of curiosity, wanted to know their origins. Like, where they were from, did, where they were. Did from. a mapping of all the bands? Yes, I did. I actually place marked it all around all around the world, wherever where we, we had one. Okay, and, and we must have a lots, band the most from one specific state, right? California. It's all La- Los Angeles, San Diego. A lot of them are from there. But we've had a few from New York. Right. A couple sporadically throughout the southern states. But Duluth, Minnesota, in the middle of nowhere in terms of the things that we've reviewed. Granted, and, we've only looked at a small selection of 53. Three three of the individuals from various bands, and I will not name names, are not even from this earth. We had to, we had to use Google Worlds. That's right. Daft Punk was on the moon. Yes. One of them. The other one was from Mars. Of course. And, well, and, one, then, and then, one of the members of uh, Steam Powered Giraffe is from the future and thus could not be placed on the map. Well, and also I was going to say Steam Powered Giraffe. It just needs to be Steam, an altered map. You know, Steam you Powered Giraffe. You need to talk to a cartographer from the future. They're not from anywhere. They were built. They're not born. So we're just going to keep talking over Matt because well, he's trying to make a point. Place of assembly. I'm sure there's a made oh, in China true. on their butt. Yeah. <laughs> I'm made in China. Right, because everything of value is made in China. It's like yeah. Bender No, everything, Rodriguez. period, is made in China. It's Bender Bending Rodriguez or something. Bender B. Bot Rodriguez. Right. What or, about him? Rodriguez. He has a birthplace. Yeah, Mom's Factory. Yeah. He's a robot. And? This is the longest not, intro we've no, had in a while. Not, well, that's because we're also horribly avoiding the yeah, album. Yeah, there's a very good reason we're doing Let's this. Dive in. But Let's dive in. Do not be prejudiced against Ignore. the biologically deficient. I don't care what John's saying anymore. So this week's is John's Good pick. Job. Good Cared? Job. Good job. You did John? this album. You had to care so John, much. John, shut up and tell him your pick. This week we did Jimmy Eat World. Damage. It's their eighth album. It came out in June of this year. I and picked it because Matt brought it to my attention. He was going to do it. I'm putting this disclaimer out there. He was going to do it, but decided to do Pacific Rim, so I was like, oh, Jimmy Eat World, I'll do it. Yeah, not a better decision. Yeah, I, I, I almost want my pick back, because I've just had so many bad choices in the last few weeks. Yeah, yeah, you have. I'll not be quiet. Avoid that. 
Okay. Yours aren't all winners either. I'm going to lick your face. Flying Lotus, the only one you get to mention. And By the way, I've looked at his other work. It's actually very interesting. We had a dud. Menomena. Love their earlier work. And grew to love that album. Low was disappointing after you talked it up. I agree with that. Because it was folk and they abandoned the grunge feel. And Still, Interpol look at their was also work. disappointing. Uh, mid-range for me. Okay, so, like, yeah. So we're all... We can pick up other Are we going to spend valuable podcast time berating each other's right. choices? Because, do you want me to go into this? I will go into this. No, 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 no. no. Jimmy Eat World, a oh, little bit off. of background. Started as an indie punk rock band with leaning towards pop, eventually became a more pop punk band or pop indie band and have been going steadily more and more pop as the years go along. Sadly, this was not to their benefit. While the last few albums have been good, maybe not the best in the world, but definitely worth standing alongside their earlier, much more indie-oriented work, this album was... Mm. Wow. So a point I pointed out to Steve, that was redundant, um... Because Steve's not as familiar with their work as me and John, is that something I, I've always noticed from Jimmy Eat World, and that I wanted to make apparent, is that on their previous records, they always had a semblance of variety. Not huge, vast varieties, but they they had a, a fun song, a slow song, a dancey song. They, they at least kept it engaging. Let me get at the pretentious part first. I'm not familiar with their discography, it's true. I'm familiar with the style. I've heard a lot of other music like this throughout the last decade and a half or so. It's it's not... So part of it is an originality problem. The other part of it is emotion. There's a, a sincere... There's a lack of emotion for the idea that they're trying to get at. Which so I'm going to get straight out. This is a breakup album. Or at least a parting album. It shows the sorrows of falling out of love like so many albums do. It shows what should be sorrows of falling. That's the whole thing. It never reaches the true culmination of the emotional oomph of a breakup. Well, the lyrics describe it, though. You can't avoid that. It does describe it. It's just, yeah, the emotion which should be there. It's kind the, of the marriage solace. between the music <coughs> and the lyrics is just a little bit weak for me. And um, this is the second time I'm going to use this for the second pick of John's. This is department store music to me. There's very little. Uh, there's very there's a little little hook, I guess you could say. But again, the point I was making in the beginning was that this is kind of very not like them. For previous works that I showed you proof of. Stylistically, it's not that far. But at least being more engaging. Their other stuff had more of a variety and was a little more engaging than this record Well, maybe is. by the sheer fact that it was a little bit more upbeat. Yeah, well, that too. Well. Alright. We're diving in. First track is Appreciation. This was the most familiar of sounds that they produced. Uh, my notes are typical Jimmy Eat World. It was right. a decent intro to the album, but as far as Jimmy Eat World went, this is what I expected. So the first track I wasn't that disappointed with. It had that re same repetitive chord nature that you come to know from, by them. It did have their, their more emotional vocals. Uh, no, I actually noticed that. There's a little the bit of a lilt, a lilt like at the ends of their phrases here and there, which I was kind of into. I was like, alright, I see. I hear the emotion in, in his vocals at least, even if the, the song itself isn't very inviting. Uh, but uh, I guess as a whole, it wasn't really an exciting intro to me. It didn't really allure me in or, or, or tell me there was going to be more greatness to come, so to speak. Hence why I said it was nice, because nice is the most... Boring, undescript word. You could, it's nice. That's nice. It's, you know, I'll never, I'll never stop hearing this. Every single time I mention nice, like when I'm at home, or, or, or I, I mention it to my mother. My uh -huh. mother would always say that she had a teacher way back in high school who used to reject papers and say write them again if they had one usage of the word nice in them because it was so about, horribly an undescriptive term. Yes. What about good? Uh, probably anything of the kind. Mm. Yeah. But, I mean, and also I use that because I really discovered how nondescript nice was, or really got it, when George Car Carlin used it in one of his bits. That's why I say it like that. That's nice. That's nice. How nice. Because that's how he describes it. It's just such an empty, terrible word. And that's why I use it. It's a nice intro. It's... Yeah. That's pretty much it had, did, the best way to describe it. It had some of the better lyrics, and this is where... Oh, I disagree with that. I didn't really notice No, I did, I did enjoy the chorus. We built... It's okay. Shh. I'm reading. We build, we box, we carry on as people we forget. 
Strange we come to find ourselves not knowing we're lost. It it really is explaining the theme of this song, which is they are breaking up because of inattention. Which is a little bit more unusual as far as breakup songs go. And it does come across in the lyrics. But that song that that <clears throat> the emotion of it was found no, to me a, a lot stronger in the second track. A no, lot more in damage. That's than a problem. Inattention is not something you're going to get a visceral response to. Oh, I think you can. I mean... If you're being ignored, yes. But if you're talking about how you were ignoring someone, and that's why you broke up, I mean, where's there's that There's no sympathy go? there. Yeah, there's no, there's, there's no sympathy, there's no anger. You can't work either side of the coin there. Moving on to track two, Damage, which is the title track, perpetuates Jimmy Eat World's cycle of... Usually, uh, the title track on most of the records is one of the more interesting tracks, and this one was one of the more interesting tracks on the And it's record. usually towards the beginning of the album, too. Yes. The boot. Um, Damage, while remained very safe, had a, had a very good breakdown in it, and... Um, some interesting guitar work, but the guitar work eventually gets drummed, uh, drowned out by the drums, which does hurt it. I don't know. It was a strum fest for me. Yeah. Like, it was just, the guitar work so boring. That's the problem with a lot of these tracks, to be honest, so I'm even, I didn't notice that as, as early as this track, per se. I, the immediate things that I noticed, I guess, are the fact that the lyrics or the verses themselves sound kind of redundant. They're not really stated uh, uniquely a second or third time. They're not really adding much more the second or third time. It really just feels... It's, it's almost a round. You know, it just goes on and on and on. So, it was pretty boring apart for the fact that the lyrics themselves, if you pick them out one by one, they have some pretty uh, eye-opening lines here. One or two, are we too damaged to possibly connect... Uh, even the opening line of the song, I want someone who lives up to the grandeur in my head. But these are relatable themes, I think. Yeah. Or anyone could probably listen to them and be like, oh, that's, um, that's, I feel your pain a little bit. But it's not the same kind I of... I know that feels, bro. Actually, more that than what I said. You know yeah. why? Because that's sympathy. Yeah. Not empathy, necessarily. Yeah. I don't feel empathy in this album. I can't put myself entirely 100% in his shoes because he's not, he's not inviting me to do that. He's not he's not stating the music in a way that matches what he's saying. For those keeping score at home, typically I will chime in with the emotion of each song as we go. There's not going to be any of this on this record, unfortunately. It's just by track two, and it becomes really apparent by track three, it becomes glaringly obvious. It's just, like, even though it's obvious it's a breakup album, I feel... No depression, no sympathy, no triumph, no moving forward, no healing, no nothing. It's just, for a breakup album, I don't feel anything. That said, let's talk about the end of this track. The <coughs> end of this track had something going for it. Uh, it was a brief bridge. The lines, I'll say when I'm ready, you'll know when I'm ready, start to get repeated. And this, was, th this actually changed the tone of the track. This, this stepped away from that repetition that had been going on thus far. And this is where... Everything gets a lot softer, a little bit more serious, and this was actually one of the high points of this entire album to me. Kind of a early to reach that peak, but it, we're reaching it, so I yeah. gotta say it. There was a moment there, as they're saying these lines, they say it a few times, and then the chorus comes back to be stated over it. And while both are going on at once... It almost, I hate to say, but it almost seems like it was an accident. It very well could not have been. It could have been planned. But there's a point where it reaches this chord. It's like a, it's, it's a flat five chord almost, you could say. But it's only because of the fact that the two lines met at that one point. But it was a beautiful moment where when both of those two met, it added a chord that it is so far from anything that the rest of the track is doing almost seems out of place like it's too serious the track's own good but i liked it i liked right, it because it, was... it, it actually gave me the idea that maybe there could be something more than this later on yes but it was also so fleeting and so quick it was well actually if you consider the point when they started the bridge when they started to say i'll say when i'm ready it was probably the longest the longest stretch 
of indulging in any one particular thing on this album. I guess. Later on, there are things like, you know, good moments here or there which are far more fleeting than this. This was a moment where they actually kind of dragged it out. They still ended up going back to the to the beginning, back to the yeah. verse, uh, the final chorus at the very end here. But this moment, I was enjoying it. They had a lot going for it. There's a steady bass drum in the background. Uh, I was actually doing a little, a little cool thing. But at the same time, you had like this hi-hat. It's like a simmering hi-hat in the background. It creates kind of an ambient effect. Almost yeah. like behind everything else, it, it was a nice moment. Yeah. I had to point it out because there's not much else for me to point out. Here. Yeah, the first two tracks were two of the stronger tracks on the record for me personally, and you know the rest of the album goes into Meville. Population, this record. It was a chance. Population, it, it, a lot. Point is, there's a lot of stuff that we would consider meh, but I, this is I, I the could, mayor of meh. I could sum this track up though in saying that this was a one moment that I was briefly invested in, still fleeting. But I was invested. Right. Moving on to track three, which is Lean. I have nothing on this track other than it was Uh, very repetitive. Yeah, and there was one factor that really turned me on this track, and that was really high guitar strumming during the chorus. Um, That was just... And I just couldn't get over that. It was very distracting. It didn't bother me and Steve as much, but... There was some of the, the, the playfulness in their guitar was back, but... That was well. That's you know probably how out. they meant it. You know yeah. that high, that high guitar what you're talking about. It's like a very fast guitar, almost like sixteenth or thirty second notes, going really really fast. It <sighs> almost is so fast that it creates an ambient effect. Almost. You almost don't even hear each and individual thing. Unfortunately, John's hearing them and he's focusing on them. Yeah. Yeah, I can like, see how it gets and that, and and it's one of those things make where I, mean, I find a lot in music when you notice something like that in the background, you can't unhear it. Once oh, you've can't. noticed it. If it bothers you, you will always hear it. Nay, nay, nay. We talked about this two weeks ago. I can unhear random news report that creeps me out to just appreciate a song for what it is. I can do that. Okay, not in many cases can that be done. But but this isn't just something that is a background piece. This is very forefront. And this is where you're starting to notice that the mixing in the album, the layering in the album, doesn't feel like it's up to snuff. A lot of the tracks on this record feel very demo-ish. And I mean, if they were doing that on purpose, I mean, a lot of bands do, and I just, I don't like that trend. I don't, I don't, I don't get in a, in a level of technology age that we're in now, going backwards in quality to convey an emotion. It was different on the Paramore record when she was playing the uke by herself and it had that echoey feel. That was to convey a that's loneliness. That's different. It's a girl and strings in a box. You know, that's a different... It was this, to convey um, something. This is, this is coming from Green Day here. This is coming from the Green Day trend that punk has its origins. Well, I, I'm saying that as if Green Day actually started. Of course, Green, uh, punk goes back a lot farther, but Green Day's kind of popularized that, repopularized it in the 90s, that punk has its origins in in teenage, play-out-of-your-garage angst. You know, it should be raw. It should be gritty. I understand that. I don't really like it. I still think that with every musician should come a certain degree of maturity because it, for the most part, rule of thumb here, that I, that whole concept is enjoyed by teenagers who are still that age. So as your audience grows with you, you should grow with them. They're going out there. They're finding other music. You can't just keep playing the same exact stuff you were doing. It shows your own personal immaturity. Uh, in this particular case, I'm not going to go so far. There is one moment later why I think it does go that far to be demo-ish. But th- at this point I I can't be that harsh. I just simply think it had very little character to it. The little bit maybe was in the vocals, because he sang very differently in this track than he sang usually. Yeah. I mean also Lower, re- lower we're, register. We're coming on different sides of this also. I'm I'm taking a very... Steve approach, I guess, to this album. I have uh, an expectation based on the discography, mm. and I'm already at this point very disappointed, which is making it harder for me to be as forgiving, you know, whereas I'm kind of the same base level of harsh on the record. And I want to backpedal about 30 seconds ago, where Steve was talking about how he's singing lower in a much lower register. That's where I feel like you're starting to see they're making these slips. Because that high pitched guitar competes too much with a lower registered voice. I can and understand that. Yeah. That's where I'm saying. It's not that I can't unhear it, it's I can't hear the vocals to begin with. Right. This gets even this this problem with, with layering becomes more prevalent down the line. 
Next track, Book of Love. Actually, I don't have a problem with the layering. This is one of the few tracks I don't have a problem Book with Book of layering. Love actually is one of the last tracks on the record where I don't absolutely... Like, You're not no, going, oh my god. There's no track on this album that I hate. Oh, I did that thing Steve hates where I lean forward while talking. I apologize. Anyway, um, at least I know I did it. It was somewhere around 24 minutes. Um, anyway, so... This song was pretty. I, like, I liked it. This was one of the songs that almost made me feel. Because it, it was pretty. So I got... A, almost felt something. There's a very shallow rise in the last few tracks in that character personality that yeah. I'm talking about. It's generally very lacking on this album. But between tracks two and four, there's a slight uphill rise. I was actually getting to the point where as of track four, as of Book of Love, I was like, alright, I kind of feel this a little bit. There's almost a shred of empathy here. It's not much, but this is easily, I think, even if I have more favorite moments elsewhere in the track, this may be one of the most cohesive tracks in terms of not really having any moment of offense. And I think it's because they took a bit of a folk vibe here. Yeah. Oh, I would agree. Yeah, absolutely. Wholeheartedly. And with all that positive, let's start pointing out the negative stuff. Besides the fact that it's formulaic, and I really don't want to keep repeating that, but it's going to get hard not to. This one was that pseudo-acoustic sound. Pseudo-acoustic as in, it's really an electric guitar, but he's playing it so lightly, so airily, and he's singing in a manner that is more simp- indicative simple of guy with guitar graveler, folk, you more, know, More gravel in the voice. That is a cop-out which turned me off of the song. That composition, because I would not expect that in this genre, not a not a not this early in an album, something like that is usually reserved for the ending, and we get that in the ending yeah, as well. But it's equally a cop out at the end. It could be a cop out if you put it at the end because that's it's, predictable too. At this point, it's such a uh, um, a predictable idea, a predictable concept that I can't really accept songs like that anymore. Well, the funny thing about this track is it actually is a little bit more of an ode to the positive sides of love, which means it's a bit of a bipolar effect in terms of the emotions here. On one hand, he's he's ready to bail, and then on the other hand, he's looking at positive moments. You know, it's nice. There's nice. This is a nice thing we got here. And then at other moments, he's totally gone, and then at other moments, he wants her back. It's it's very schizophrenic in that regard. Uh, but not. But something being that schizophrenic is not that, not that hard to believe. No, it's when not. Dealing with no, love. not necessarily at all. That that wasn't a critique. Okay. At all. Um, specifically, the one thing I want to mention in this track is that chorus, because this is the point. This is the reason I actually pointed pointed it out as, as a bit of a folk vibe here. It's another. It's another one of those chord progression moments. It was like a classic folk style, the kind of thing you'd really expect to hear in a coffee shop. It, the manner in which he's speaking goes from that four chord to that one six, the first inversion, and then the minor two, and then the one. And it's that minor two where you really, really feel that 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 emotion. That's where you really feel the connection that he has or had with the person that he's talking about. And then when it settles back on one, it's really like he's being laid down to bed. And there was a line here that actually talks about being laid to bed as if you've already made your bed. Yeah. So. There was a believable thing. That's that connection I'm talking about here. He had a moment in this track. As I said, he had a moment back in Damage. These are the things that are generally lost in the other... In, in the general focus of these, this album. These... Found, finds it in moments. Yeah, th- these those two songs you get close to feeling, but you still don't really feel. But you get close. It brings you closer than anything else on the record has and will. You know, you get these glimpses that there was something there, but it, it just it's not enough. Because there's still such fleeting moments that go so quickly. Still, I, I will defend Book of Love just for being, um, just for being as consistent. I guess you could say. No, Book of Love it still is doesn't. The, it does, still doesn't alter the tone of the song very much. Book of Love is also the last track, pretty much on the entire record that really offers us anything yeah. that stands out. Book of Love was just such an upbeat track. I think maybe that that it's closer to that stuff old older uh, Jimmy, Jimmy World, World that yeah, you're talking probably. about. The upbeat saves it in many ways. It's yeah. like, oh, this is this isn't happy. This is nice. I can get on board with this. You know, you'd really have to be kind of a dick to get in there and be like, I hate this. It's right. not impossible to hate that stuff. Yeah. But moving on to track five, even though we don't want to, 
I will. What is that? Oh, I will steal you back. This okay. Uh, I only have one word written down. Right. Bland. Okay. I wrote mediocre. Hey. There's, there's High five on yeah. the podcast. There's a few things I have with this. <laughs> Did we peek? Of course you peeked. You <laughs> slapped bit. your hands. A bit. Yeah. Awesome. Um, Next we have a designated slapping position approximately <laughs> five feet away from that. <laughs> the balance problems are back. The, yeah. the layering problems are back, especially with the verses. The choruses were actually... They had interesting aspects, which I did not hear on headphones. i got to point this out. Uh, whatever I was listening to on my headphones really didn't sound too good. In speakers, it sounded much better. And actually, had had that Jimmy vibe. The verses were just so out of whack with the balancing. I really just couldn't enjoy it. And it's also when I noticed that their lyrics were just full-fledged stream of thought. That's all they're doing now. You know... I noticed that a lot, a little bit later, but at this particular track, uh, there were very few lyrics to this track. In many, this track was kind of minimalist in terms of the message. The message is the title itself. I will steal you back. That gets repeated so many times throughout this track. It, re- you really, you can't look into it much more than that. It, it simply is that. He, yeah, but he this starts is one reminding of the, himself. But to the, do this. this is one of those tracks where, when the when it's repeated so many times, it loses value. It no, I agree. Boring. I agree a hundred percent. It's I like that say, song. I can't call this a stream of consciousness because right. it's it's one it's one. <laughs> it's one, one conscious. Con- well, that's it's it's. it's, it's <laughs> we all have one. Time. Shows the the the, the aspect I of the single notes. track mind, unable to think of anything but her. And I'm trying to do something a lot deeper than this actually there, and I really don't understand why I'm doing something so deep. It's not that deep. That it's it's yeah, it's stream of thought. He couldn't think of anything else than stealing her back. Well that's the problem. I mean That's not very that's that's not that's not good enough content wise. It's not well look, we could take the uh paper chase hide the kitchen knives route with this and and show some manic to his behavior here, but he's not that. It's actually a very the music's not manic, the vocals aren't manic. None it, of it. it this is a, that it uses a very very formulaic song to achieve the end of 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 desire of of pent up desire here, and eh, I don't. Feel hey, it. listeners, I just let, don't feel it. Hey, listeners, let's play uh, a crash course drinking game. Take a shot every time we say formulaic in this review. You'll be drunk three minutes <laughs> hey, that's in. That's the first time I said it. John said it. Yeah, time. John said it like three times. I think I said it once. Yeah. Matt will be beer. We all. I get will it. be vodka. We're all allotted like five. Okay. We should have like little slips of paper. Well, if we were a video them, podcast, there'd be jar. a counter that pop up on screen. Drink. That's right. Um, all right. Moving on to the next track. We have, please say no. Hey, I wh- want to say no to the track. Hey, look, it's an emo song. Yeah. Wait, no. no. Eh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's my take on it, apparently. <laughs> but just, you don't have to say anything else. It's just, eh, period. Eh. Okay. It's a guy with a guitar kind of intro. It's not really pure emo to me. It's like, this is back to that coffee shop vibe again. It's like it's just so slow and repetitive. It's it, indie emo. I'm not know, indie man. coffee shop music. Me neither. But this one's just so slow and drags on. Also, so I got really ragey while we were listening to this track because <laughs> this song, this song is almost five minutes long. It's the longest track on the record, and it's so repetitive. Halfway through the track, you could end it and you'd get the whole sense of the song. Meanwhile, back in Damage. There was a sweet little solo you got 30 seconds of, not, not even, even, 15 seconds of, that they could have expanded on if they made it a freaking five-minute song. That was one of the fl- incredibly fleeting moments And I'm it was a great about. solo. Okay. But they even have a little bit of a chord, uh, a nice little tone change at the chorus. But it just repeats. It's just, it just repeats. so repeats. repetitive. We got, we got five seconds of reflecting piano work. They're... Yep, and that was like the. And you're deepest... talking to somebody who, like, when we were listening to one, uh, one Republic, and the song, I think it was, uh, uh, what was it? That's what I want. That's what you wanted. Like yes. that, that song is really repetitive. But I really listened to it recently, and it didn't bother me as much as it bothered you. However, this song, that's what you wanted. It I'm just remembering bothered, it. It just bothered me so much that it was so repetitive. It's like it's as if they're flexing their muscles in a box that is only as wide as your entire arm's length. It's yes. like you can't do much. That is you, a very unusual. That was metaphor. almost John level. Yeah, metaphor. you're you're de- diving into the depths of my metaphorical nature. That's dangerous. Hey, I have my own met- metaphors, but they're concise. <laughs> well, oh, you, you said, had you had your concise. Moments I heard box, you, right? and I immediately thought of Stranger. 
<laughs> of course. I can't think of boxes without cats. Well, that takes this in a different direction. Anyway, this is the another one. Here. This this cements the lyrical disconnect for the album. This is probably the worst of the those disconnects. And the pacing of each line was just off at points where it's like, forget about rhyming. All right, there's no actual progression. Of, what's what's the word? Pacing, tempo, to the words. <laughs> meter. They do pop. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> meter. Oh, brother. There's no meter to the words. There, it, and it's not off by like a syllable or two. Some of the lines are like five syllables off and are trying to hit the same. Yeah, meter. Was, I think that was more of a case in how you'd have me than please say no. To be honest, uh, it, was, it got bad. And please say no. And please uh, say no. You, to be honest, my main problem is is the chord progressions here. I I was just a little bit tired of the four, sometimes five, sometimes they would throw like two chords in the in the uh, in the third measure or so but it, in general it's just it's a cycle that i'm so used to i can't feel the emotion again yeah. i know he's trying i know he's trying to fit it in there he's trying to squeeze it in it's just it's that framework it's that box that i'm talking about yeah. you can't do much within it it's my like biggest a, ooh, ooh, metaphor it's like a washing machine that's worse that's, that's if you all can do is go around in a circle Oh, in a box uh, a little bit I guess my biggest problem with this song was the song itself moving on <laughs> try to fit shapes how'd in you, other shapes <laughs> it's like how do you have met me this, how do you have me how do you have me how you I'm have having me. a John moment words are hard this was okay and this is not a positive or negative thing to the song pain but this was the song pain without the awesomeness of pain's choruses yeah this was the bass line of their verses the, the song, and never fluctuating from that. The song Pain uh, from Futures, Futures uh, which w- is a really good song. Um, also, yeah. Uh, the, the song Pain was one of those songs that had a great rise and a great fall and it, it, it just flowed really well. This song was missing that flow completely. If it you're, you're going to have a little side, empty. John, where you get to uh, say, all right, here's a thing that I'm comparing it to that, that doesn't help nor hurt, but I'm going to mention it anyway, then I'm going to throw myself back to damage and say that there's a point when he goes damaging, damaging, that actually sounds like Navy Beans, Navy Beans in Adam Sandler's uh, Lunch Lady sketch from early 90s SNL. Done. Moving on. Okay. So, do you have anything to say about How Do You Have Me? Oh, I have a lot to say about How You'd Have Me. Go for it. Alright. The problem here, this is where I had the Educate us, Professor Steve. Please teach us. Push oh, up I your will. Glasses. He's not Wait, wearing children. glasses. Push him up, Matt. I'm going to count to three. I don't want detention. The problem here is that the music itself does not make me interested enough to look up and dissect these lyrics. <laughs> Nevertheless, I'm a bit of a masochist, so I did it anyway. It's true, <laughs> he is. Nice segue. Here's the thing. These lyrics, they... They could, could be Shakespeare. I still wouldn't care. I still would... That, that, even Shakespeare, to, the, to this song, would only make it, like, a three at best, this track. But in general, it, it doesn't matter. Because even those lyrics themselves... This is the track, John, to speak to your point back in Please Say No. This is the track that has lyrics that just don't seem to really fit very well together. It doesn't seem to be poetic to me. Stream of consciousness lyrics only exist in certain ways. Like we of course we when we reviewed Weird Al Albuquerque, that stream of consciousness song was great because it was so off the wall and ridiculous and random. It it works it in works. A, it, it can work in a folk oriented as well. Very easily. It storytelling work, yeah. stream of consciousness. They're not doing storytelling here, which is what stream of consciousness knew. To speak to what you said, Steve, I feel like please say no was worse but not much worse than this track. Um, and yes, it was a very halting nature to the words, which caused you to sort of hiccup as you're listening to it. That's the pro- Well, that's the problem. It, if you took these lyrics alone and you simply read them, I think you'd feel as if they were just a bunch of words strung together. You'd have meaning here and there, but in general, it's just they don't flow very well. There's no, there's hardly any rhymes throughout the track. Not that you have to have rhymes, but where people lack rhymes, they usually make up for in alliteration, in right. in, in a clever wit or turn of phrase. Well, that, there's very little of that here. It's just a lot of thought. I mean, the, also the thing is like 
I'm not a person who needs the lyrics to make sense to enjoy it. I mean, after all, I do like old Rob, Rob Zombie, and those songs never made sense. But they were, they actually, they had meter, or they were, you know, they were poetic, or they were just fun. There was none of that here. Nothing. Come on, I'm, so two of my favorite bands are Beatles and System of a Down. Look at, look at I Am the Walrus. Or Chop Suey. Or Science. No, Chop Suey actually flows. Oh, does it? Science is a random collection of words by System of a Down. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. It's an epic song because of its the way it, it's, it's designed. There's no designing to these songs. Here's the thing. At times he can be clever, a little clever. He can be sweet. A lot of sweetness throughout this album. Uh, but And maybe I might sympathize here and there, but that's about it. In general, I feel nothing in the way of empathy. Uh, the other little thing with this track is it's got that... And this is actually kind of a funny one. At first, I liked it, but I ended up hating it for reasons of context, because there was this courtesy silent moment. It lasted for just a few seconds. It was like chimes, no vocals, where everything got silent. They took away the general, almost loudness of this track, and they took it way down, thinned it to just a few instruments, as if to say, wait for it, wait for it. And it was only, the only thing that came back was a slightly louder version version of the previous three minutes. It's it's a very annoying thing when they do that, because they could have done so much more with it. It's another fleeting moment. Could have went into a new section. Could have added a whole new instrument. Could have comped over it. It was just the same exact thing they went went back to. It's, it's, it's a problem I have when you're telling me to wait for something that really isn't that spectacular yeah. in such a dramatic way. The silence itself was dramatic. The return just it fizzled. Yeah, I don't know. I just at this point, I'm running out of notes for this song, for this for album, the, the songs, and for the songs on the album. I mean, it's just, I don't know. And then, so, what we move on? Where are we? I don't even know where we're at. Are we up to no never? Is no that never. Track we're at okay. No never. Last few weeks, uh, last few months, whenever we're listening, I tend to get belligerent during an album if I don't, if I'm not really enjoying it, and this is usually about. 80% of the way through a 16-track album, I'll, I'll start making snide remarks about, like, bad things while still commenting on the good ones. This album was able to do it by track 8. I got... I just... I was done at this point. This this is a song I was really done with the well, whole album. I, well, percent, percentage-wise, you know, considering it's, it's in the same spot, only 10. Yeah, yeah. But it's really... Eight tracks in, we're talking. This is a problem. But my biggest problem with this track and all is tracks that are very it, short. my biggest problem with this track is that it actually gave me hope for about ten seconds. The drum yeah. intro was actually kind of different, a little bit. I mean, it was still cliche, but it was at least different for the record, and I got Fair a little enough. bit of hope. Fair enough. And then it was dashed to bits within like ten seconds. I still say that, believe it or not, my favorite drum moment was going back to damage that second half. No, of damage. yeah, yeah. No, I'm not no, saying I... that this was the best drum moment. I'm just saying it was a different drum moment. So it gave me I hope. In that there would be variety again, and there wasn't. That's probably you, because that, that drum moment was basically just an intro, and then it goes back into kind of the same exact tone. Uh, it's just very meth. And I'm going to agree with John here. This album, this is the moment, ex- the exact same moment, where I realized that this album is more work for me than Tomorrow's Harvest by Boards of Canada, which is interesting comparison only because I really, I really liked that album. Yeah, It actually challenged me intellectually, but we all agreed that it was a bit of a chore because it is ambient music. You're dissecting ambient music. It's kind of not done generally. And it's very complicated ambient music and there's all that aspects of it. Yeah, there's a lot. It's a a chore on the mind. This is a a different kind of chore for me. It's work for the exact opposite reason. It's so simple and it's so boring. It's nulling. Yet, it's nulling. I said that this whole album is very but, numbing. But, because it, you just don't... <laughs> but, really, all the words there. But, 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 but. It's not something that makes me angry at the music. It's That's not That's the biggest issue. Yeah, it's not offensive because the other way either. I don't dislike it because it's so bland. It's, you're, it's hard to force yourself to keep up with it, to pay attention. That's where this tr- this album is really heading towards. We talked that's, over yeah, this. That, that's that's actually exactly what I was trying to get up. Yeah, it's yeah. it's 
you're you drift because the music cannot entertain you. The thing is, every every interlude, you just have straight eighth notes in this particular track. It's just, there's no fluctuation throughout this entire... Th- the drum fills, occasionally they're okay, but it, you're not even focused on the drum fills because what's clearly prevalent is the guitar. Yep. And the guitar is simply just going eighth notes. Da, 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 da. You know, it's... It, it's uh. <laughs> yes, let's move on. So the next song is Bye Bye Love. No spaces in the title. Just to it's one be word. different. Um, this is the one exception to everything I said. Bye Bye Love was definitely the most interesting track since uh, Book of Love. It had the most going for it. I might challenge you here, because but I see what you're saying. It is the most Thanks. unique of tracks for for the past six, seven rounds. And that's not saying anything. First of all, I had the same moment as Matt here. More so than Matt had in the beginning of No Never, I had here uh, in terms of the intro. This offered a different tone to me. It was a lot slower, a lot more mellow, and I do see what John was saying here at this moment. This, This offered something different, and it was different than the rest of the album just because we're slower. And it, that's it was really sweet. all we're talking about. The, and it was sweet. It, it was but sweet. The, the chorus has destroyed it with the introduction of all the extra instrumentation. Well, because it was still destroys, the, it the same speed. The well, it was still the same speed, but it was so much more complicated and didn't it didn't build, it didn't grow. It abruptly it just added a mess. It abruptly shattered to the top, and it, it it ruined the mellow mood they were going for. There was a moment way back as early as Damage or Lean that you called this uh, a, a, a demo quality, and I I really just don't I don't see it. I think that's too harsh for the beginning of this album. Here, and this is what I was saying earlier. This is the moment where I. Oh, the last it. two tracks, it's glaringly obvious. Glaringly obvious. It's a shame because you know you can't help. This is a digital age. You look at the time stamp and you're like, ooh, four. Right? This is a little bit longer than the typical track in this album. Maybe they this will something. be. Maybe this will be a you know a, a big way to go out. A lot of albums do that. It, no. it was. It. The thing is, we're getting a little repetitive here. The problem is, even though it was slower. That doesn't save it, necessarily. It was because sl- wh- by getting slower, there's a few things that you give yourself room to achieve, such as more emotion, right? right. You could achieve that with a slower tempo. Um, a little bit more emphasis on the individual instrument. And they did achieve that once in this track, come to think of it. They achieved it a little bit later. The instrumental that came much, much deeper into the track had some kind of cool layering, but it came in so deep into the track, so late, too late to care, and there wasn't enough of it. Same problem. They didn't go on long enough with it. They just returned to the same thing. It's just... It feels like there's a, a, there's a fear to, to dive in to their good ideas. My biggest They're problem- there. Yeah. My biggest problem with the record at this point, and this song specifically, it, is that there isn't any problem specific to this song. For me, at this point, it's uh, second verse, same as the first. It's literally just, I'm bored at this point for the same reasons I've been bored. There's, n- like, I have notes, but it doesn't matter. I'm repeating myself. I'm no, ready like to move that. on to the next song. I like that. Second verse, same as the first. That's pretty good. was an old man named Same boss, Finnegan. same boss. <laughs> Next boss. He had whiskers on his chin again. They grew um, out and then grew in again. Poor old Michael Finnegan begin again. Last thing about this track, it's not just demo quality. It's not in the mixing. There's a little bit of a, uh, and I hate to say this because this is the harshest comment. There's a little bit of a garage band level going on here, and this goes back to my it's comment an about immaturity about on the record. Punk earlier, which you know, punk kind of survives off of that. That raw nature. Yeah, immaturity. but this band was never like. No, it's that. right. They're not yeah. really punk, punk necessarily. No. They die emo here or there. Really kind of indie. They were mostly they're, indie. Yeah, they're, indie really, punk. they're they're kind of they're kind of hovering around each genre with dipping their toes in each. They never really they never really dive in. They, they, they never stay, cannonball. Yeah, they stay indie, but try to. But at least in the other rock, other times they've done it, pop and punk on other albums, they'll they won't jump in, but they'll still play with it. Well, in any case, the reason I point out the garage band nature here is simply because the points in which they get slow, such as the instrumentals, they're in a tone here and there, it just feels like like they don't know what to do with it. It's like they've been handed a card, and and they're just, I don't know how to play this. It feels very empty. 
Yeah. Very empty. Which is why they lack the ability to jump into the choruses and why the choruses are abruptly harsh and abruptly ending. Yeah, it's like, we might as well end it now. We can't do much more with it. It's like... And then moving though, forward into okay. the last I'm here to tell track. you, you could have. Because <laughs> let's stop beating this dead horse and move to the final track, please. The final track has the same you issue. You were good. This is, you were good has the same issue as Bye Bye Love. Multiple issues are the same. One... It still has that slow feeling without any actual travel. It's way too long without actually going anywhere. And it's still a garage band level. No, uh, this is the ring of a demo as well. But and the, this, at, and least, this was at the... least though, was intended to. The, right. Well, this the, was the... the mixing of it was meant to sound as if it was like you know straight off a tape. This was the cla- the cliche. Uh, a guy with an acoustic guitar. Think good riddance Which by Green Day. We kind of already had earlier in the album. Yeah. What it is is they're trying to make you feel something by saying they have nothing. That's the funny thing you mentioned. There was a guy a t- with a guitar uh, way earlier, like in we're Please so Say No, cool. John. But like you, you mentioned, you know that it's usually done at the end of the yeah, album. Yeah, I know. Yeah. You got that. That's why. I Are you happy it with out. it though? Are no. you happy? No. <laughs> well, so, you had said no, something. The, the whole thing is they're acting. It's that cliche. We're so poor. Love us for it. You said something <laughs> during um, during the Pacific Rim review when when they were for, moments where they were forcing you to feel something, and you phrased it a certain way, but I can't remember what it was. But I feel that in this track, I'm being forced to feel something that's not there. Yeah, I, I did say that. With actually, I said that with the majority of that. And the worst but the, what I'm saying is that's so apparent and egregious in this song. The yeah. reason for that, and the worst part of that, is the squeak in the voice. Yes. Which I don't get it. He can hit those high notes he's going for. Why is he going like this? He's he goes up. Why? Then he's doing that. I didn't notice that. I didn't notice that no, either. no, there was some cracking in his voice. I don't get it. And he doesn't have the crack. I gotta be fair here. I had no issues with his vocals throughout this entire yeah. album. His vocals are 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 solid, and in, in other words, they meet they meet the mark. My but, biggest problem with this song was also that it was long and had no business being long, except for that little sweet moment that you yeah, liked usually, towards the end. But there was no reason for this song to be almost. Yeah, this was another case. To be honest, it's amazing how I feel. I feel it in a different way in each and every track. How like ooh, little inst- ooh, little interlude, little instrumental that offers some. That offers some new things, but they don't do enough with it. Then they go back to the old. Like I'm, I wind up repeating the same exact words for this, even though it feels different in each and every it's track. Like They're just doing it in a different way. It's like NASCAR. They're making a left turn. They're making a left. Well, of course, the reason for that is because they're coming up with a new idea sure, each and every sure time. Change. Each and every time they come up with a new one, I, the new idea. You know, it seems like they don't know what to do with it. It's yeah. just it, they did that in Bye Bye Love, but that was one idea. Here, they're doing it, and you were good. It's another idea. Therefore, I have no recourse but to describe it in the same exact manner, because... Again, wrapping up on this record, like, the most frustrating thing for me is that exactly what you said, that they come up with these ideas and don't know what to do with it. The reason it's frustrating for me is, and it's so apparent on Invented, their last record, which came out three years ago, is they had ideas like that and did such beautiful things with them. You know, it wasn't mind-blowing, but they did some fun things and some great things that were engaging, at least. And in this, they did those same pretty things, but they were so fleeting and disappeared. And it's so disappointing. Some bands continuously raise the bar, some don't. We already had our big talk about uh, safety. Yeah. Um, That was in Podcast 52. And in reality, for me, this is not going to turn me off as a Jimmy World fan. I still love all of their other records. This record I can listen to it's not going to turn me away, but it's it's not like the Green Day level where I don't want to hear another album. But it doesn't Green Day. lure me in. It's not exactly. a red carpet. It's not going to make you want to go out and check out their old stuff. The other problem is it's not fan service either. Yeah. I don't see the fans accepting this at the same level, which is weird. Because before we give our ratings, I want to yeah. talk about online. Well, I was going to bring that up. One person gave a negative rating. Rolling Stones gave it two stars. Everything else we saw was at least four, three and a four. half to four range. I don't get it. Like, I don't know what they see in it that we don't. To be honest... I've read a few. I, I really think it has to do with uh, a lack of objectivity. It's the Jimmy, fact that it's, it's Jimmy inoffensive. Eat World. It's Jimmy Eat World. They've had... Uh, they have quite a bit of albums out. Yeah. Ever since more. eight. Yeah. Altogether. 
people who love them then will love them now. It, in many cases, not everyone like looks into it as objectively as like, well, let me just take well, a step it could back also, with this band that I love. Most people don't do that. Again, it could just be like what I had said with Hoobastank when we listen to them. It's inoffensive. The reason that it's getting okay to good reviews is because it's not great, but it's not bad. It's just kind of inoffensive and blah, department store music. Hence the good reviews. Because if it's not offensive, there's nothing to rage against. JC Penny will love it. <laughs> Probably. They'll buy it for every store in there. And I went through the whole it's back in style or whatever the style tagline is for JC Penny. Are we ready to do the wrap up? Go for I have, it. I have uh, one, one last thing. comment with okay. the with the final track. Just to go back to what you said, uh, Matt, about it being egregious in terms of its. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good word choice for uh, this. Yeah, I'm but proud of that one. Egregious in terms of. Uh, in terms of its delivery, wait, wait, how are you using context? So I was saying it was egregious, how repetitive and and like the, the cliche. The cliche. It basically. I'm I'm referring specifically to the mixing. Yeah. The mixing, I think, is the most egregious quality here, is because it's meant to sound so uh, so simple and and youthful in its delivery. I, I think that's the most egregious part with, for me because we see so much of it now. It's becoming a trend or a trope I'm ready it's to call it now. It's a trope at this point, yeah. Over the course of the last 20 years, ever since ever since people first started selling uh, those little handheld recorders yeah. that people used to make their demo tapes on, which was a time of relative innocence, when it seemed like that was your first step to, toward making it in the music industry. But they've had so many albums out by now. What are you trying to prove anymore? Like I have that's, a, that's the insult a I, little bit. And it drives me nuts because there are bands like, and I'm going to throw a shout out to Almost There, a band who I'm friends with who's from Asbury Park, New Jersey. Their newest record, full length, sounds so much better quality than this one song. And they're a local band from Jersey. I mean, they've toured and they, they have a decent following and they're a great band. To be fair, I understand it's a personal choice. I I under but, I, I can't look I just, at, of course this last track is a personal choice. Of course it's a personal to choice. Be that and kind it's of a nostalgia. stupid personal choice. There you go. <laughs> that's just it. In that's what I'm looking for and, and point, you said it. That's the point I was trying to make is like almost there this band who I really like who are kind you know just kind of a great kind of just standard rock band. All of their songs sound a better quality than this one song. And Jimmy Eat World sold eight records and toured the world. Why? It's dumb. It doesn't make sense. I get the guy with the acoustic guitar. I don't mind that trope because I like acoustic guitar music. But it's the scratchy quality with it that doesn't make sense. Well, and this lot- acoustic guitar see, is one thing that seems relatively timeless. We'll all have a longing for yeah. the acoustic sounds that you only get in a non-electronic world. But the thing is, uh, that mixtape generation, yeah. that's, that's, that's obviously a bygone time. Yeah. Well, it's also the fact that the acoustic guitar is not the lead guitar. It's the backup guitar. That's the only thing playing. A lead guitar is going to do something. It's a backup guitar. It's playing a single riff. It's just, why not take the song and expand on it? Why just release it like this? If you why not have fun it with it? Yeah. I don't... You know, every, that's, that's everything I, I don't feel in many like... ways, everything about this album seems very uh, short-sighted. Watered down, it, too. Watered down, um, just cut off in general. We're Look, looking at lyrics, uh... Song structure, um, expansion of expansion of any musical idea, to be honest, and it's you, short solos for sure, and it's short, and it's added, barely, f- it's not even forty minutes. You're cutting me off because that's supposed to be the last one. <laughs> you're supposed to go <laughs> no. song, and then finally the album is yeah. really short. The, no, the last aspect, and this is the aspect that drew me to Jimmy Eat World and bands like Jimmy Eat World during my teens is. They were fun. Yeah. There was Even no there's, fun in this album. Even the sand songs were engaging and had something to them. Not in this. You know what's fun? Everything else from those early 2000s that I still listen to. Like Green Day. From that era. <laughs> I'm pointing that one out. I think we're all like, done with Green Day now. No, I'm not done. I'm going to see. I still have hope. Uh, like oh, Blink-182. You sound like all me right? with... You sound Mike. like me with all the Sonic the Hedgehog games. I kept disclaimer. I am not of this of this hope that's going on. Beside I have me. No, no, no hope. Shush. Different sidetrack. Hang on. Shush. Both of you. Green Day. Blink. Less than Jake. All right. Me first in the Gimme Gimmies. These guys had fun. Offspring. Offspring. Oh, Offspring. 
This was bands that you enjoy. That's what actually works in this framework of music. Something to get your blood pumping. Yeah, maybe it was more towards the somber side. Maybe it was more towards the depressing side. But look at Bowling for Soup. They've done a thousand and one songs that are about depressing, and yet you smile as you sing along with them. That's what they can do with it, and it's in the same framework of music. So to wrap things up, I, it's a, it's not as bad as Bare Naked Ladies, but I can't find it any better than that. So 2.25, two and a quarter, just above, you know, not really worth making. There's really, it brings nothing to the table. I, I don't see any redeeming qualities. I, there's a couple of songs I'm going to sit on. Maybe I'll grow into them. But otherwise, it's just so bland. It's so Cheerios. <laughs> I like Cheerios, though. Everybody they're, likes they're Cheerios. Very refreshing. But they're inoffensive. When you mix in strawberries or they're, blueberries they're or get the Honey Nut Cheerios or do something else with it, throw chocolate I just hate milk. that it's helping my heart so much. Grr. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's what it is. It's good for you. That's like the redeeming quality. It's this is nice. not good for you. Choose something like so, broccoli yeah. then. Two, 2.25. All right. Oh, how do I say this? Going back to your previous statement, John, you compa- you made the Green Day comparison here. That's a funny one, because... I'm not counting on Odell Strays. <laughs> well, of course you aren't. I understand that. The thing is, I never really bought that whole idea that I guess Green Day was selling, even in their early days, necessarily. But, of course, I give it the pass for being new and original for the time. That stripped-down tell like it is teenage angst bit of course original for early 90s i still think it wore off about 10 years before um green day did uno dos trace but no i agree wholeheartedly okay in terms of the stuff that jimmy eat world is doing i think that it's a lot more it's definitely more complex than that and always was a little bit more complex than that. They have they have a, a, a semblance of uh, cohesion, I guess, to their work and thinking the next step ahead. I hear that in their earlier stuff. This one, I do hear it. It's just, it's weird how they're in this little middle ground where they're not going quite far enough, in my opinion, to be a hundred percent average, acceptable modern pop. They're not going that full mark, but they're not stripping them zap down enough to be full nostalgic Green Day punk indie in that crowd. Which leaves me kind of perturbed because it makes me wonder what the ultimate point of this album is. Of course, I can only say one, and that is the sorrows that go with love being lost, which has all been done before, and I know that I can get it from so many other places that do it so much better, and invest the music, their own personal style, and infuse the lyrics with them, and it's all just one big cry fest, which I can personally get on board with, because we all gotta go down that road every now and then. Here, I just don't feel it far enough, and I feel the fact that they're sitting in that little middle ground that I just described is gonna end up hurting this a little bit more for me. I think I gotta really put this at a two. Just for that exact reason. It, it's the uh, the lack of investment in, toward one thing or another is really got to leave me a little bit below John in this regard. I, I know that they're better than this. I know it. My biggest problem with this record as a pretty big Jimmy Eat World fan um, is that A, it lacks that variety that I've talked to death at this point. You know, when you can have sweetness and the middle on the same album as Bleed American which is the closest they've ever gotten to punk. And it's still my favorite album. You know, or you take a song like Futures on the same record as the song, a song like Pain. You know, those were both on Futures, which is my favorite album. It, it's just, this album, there's no variety. Well, the variety is so minimal, it's barely noticeable. It's disappointing, it's uninspired, it's boring, and it's bland. And honestly... That makes it worse than Bernadette Ladies. Because there's a lot of bad with that album, but I still love Odds Are. It's a catchy, stupid song that I can't get out of my head that's catchy. It's at least catchy. 
And then the other song that I can't even remember the name of that we liked that was kind of Western <laughs> folky. Yeah, that one's catchy too that you can't remember. The title. Yeah, yeah. Because the chorus doesn't repeat enough. But like, those songs were catchy enough that I remember and they stuck with me and they, and I listened to them over and over again. Even though I deleted most of the album from my iPod. With this, I'm either keeping the whole album and listening straight through as if it were one track or deleting all of it. There's just not enough to differentiate one track from the other. Like, after we stopped listening to it, I already cannot remember anything but appreciation. The first track. And the last track, because it was so terrible in quality. I don't remember anything else in between. Because of that, it's a two. I wanted to rate it higher. I thought it was average. But I'm with Steve on this one. For maybe different reasons. Damage and Book of Love, those are my two tracks. Book of Love, that, that, yes. That t- seem to... I, I get lines stuck in my head here and there. But but still, it's not the same level for me as Bare Naked Ladies was. Because even though those songs were not as good a quality, and they were kind of sillier, they were memorable at least. I remember all of the lyrics to Odds Are, because they're so ridiculous. Well, that's it. Memorability. It's very tough with this album. You go through it, and we listen to it several times in a row, and there's just not very much standing out. Just to go back to my, my the thing that I mentioned about investment, and that's one reason I'm rating it so low, is that they're not going toward one thing or the other, not stripped down enough, but not pop enough, not co- cohesive enough. Damage and Book of Love are the two exceptions I'm giving. I think they went full force pop with that, and I think it worked in their favor. Those tracks would definitely be in the high threes for me. But it's or not 3. enough. Or 3.5 at least as tracks. That's a good rating. That's nice and average, and I would enjoy hearing it in any department store. <laughs> But, uh, you know. It's just one of those things where as someone who's such a big fan of and expecting something, like for me, I probably won't delete it off my iPod. I'll probably listen to it as one thing. Uh, but again, it's it's just, it's not something I'm going to go out of my way to listen to anymore. Here's the note I'm closing off with. The rest of it, aside from those two tracks I mentioned, I wouldn't even notice in a department store. Yeah, i totally just phase out. <laughs> While I'm buying my <laughs> very drab olive green sweater. <laughs> I wouldn't notice this. And tube socks. <laughs> there would be tube socks. I'd be focused on my olive green sweater you, and you'd tube socks. you go, well, I get six here, but these are four pack and they're more Not for nothing, though. I love olive green sweaters. So maybe that's a poor comparison. Oh, well. Moving on. Um, oh, we were talking earlier about concert experience and I had brought up the Bare Naked Ladies, speaking of Bare Naked Ladies, the show that I'd went to, which is actually The live experience enjoyable. in general. Yeah, yeah, live music is one of those things where... We gave an intro on it a, uh, a couple weeks ago, and by just telling our best wor- and worst concert experiences, and now we'd like to go full force into the topic. There's a lot to say about live music. My thing about live music is, I used to always think that bigger shows are better shows, but I'm finding now that I don't think believe that as much. Honestly, truthfully, I think I may like smaller shows better, because they're more intimate and engaging. I've always thought that. I've never liked the the big show. There's something to be said for it, for you have sure. To under, you have to understand, my first big show was Billy Joel in the early 90s. Yeah, and didn't John say the who? Yeah. yeah. So that'll so skew you for you're a few years. Ruined. All right, fine. It'll no, skew it for a few years. The who wasn't a big show. It wasn't. There was probably 3,000 people at most. Have they lost their fan base? No, no, no. It was like a specialty show. Interesting. We, the tickets only were released like that day. Oh, fair enough. Actually, the first time I saw Keen, well, not a Keen is like, you know, as big as The Who was, but Keen is still pretty big in terms of pop that crisscrossed from between, uh, from, uh, Britain to, to this, that, America. This, thing. From Britain to America. But they, they really did manage to kind of sweep over the, the pop stage. They're, they're, they're a band where I love to hear them in any department store, and every single time I hear them on, I'm actually a little bit distracted from whatever I'm doing. Well, that's, and like, that's, that's, a, that's a band that I think is positive department store music. I love Keen. And yet my first concert experience with them was a private little book signing in Borders Bookstore on uh, Columbus Circle. I went to with my friend James, and it was just this awesome. Like I'm my first concert. I'm right there up next to him. Yeah. That's a lot more personal to me than if I was like way in the back. And I did end up seeing them a second time in the Beacon Theater. Great, because I love the Beacon. Still, doesn't quite live up to Porter's Bookstore. I can speak to that as well. I'd seen, and I mean their band. I don't even know if they're still around. I know that they're playing soon again. But this band, Power Man Five Thousand. Who kind of does... I know them. Yeah, oh, they do yeah. fun, fast, yeah. just nice kind of new metal, fun music, you know. I, the first time I ever saw them was in B.B. King's in Manhattan. And this is a tiny little club. 
and me and my friend Neil were right in front of the stage. I high five Spider, the lead singer, like five times. And it was just the coolest experience because they're playing this fast pounding music, and you're right up front in the band's face, interacting with the band. And that's what I think I like more. I mean, I've seen plenty of bands who do it, do great shows in stadiums. Also, I mean, again, I said. One of my favorite concerts was the Gorillas, and that was a huge MSG show. In but that was ways. for a different reason. That it was great. And anyways, I think that that's that's my uh, that's my one big uh, recently. Like I, I really didn't have the big super a stadium concert experience all most of my life. I've tried to go for pretty small ones. Mainly it was also because money. But uh, recently I saw Muse in April. I saw them in MSG, and of course. I understand it when I was there because they're a band that they cater themselves so much to the symphonic rock. It's almost impossible to not do that in the grand scale. Yeah. So that, because I know them as such, you know, might not be the same watching Muse like in a little a tiny nightclub. Little, yeah. But there is one aspect that you're going to get from big stadiums that you'll never get from smaller venues. And this, I think, is probably the biggest redeeming quality. And that is the true moment of euphoria when that band hits that note where everybody's singing along you got 5,000 people singing the words along with the band no, you can't even hear the music at that point but you get caught up and you're yelling along with them and there's no way you can ever replicate that it's, where it's that, that moment that moment of just pure everyone's in sync you know what sometimes I think it has to do with it's, it's that that uh, dichotomy be- between personal revelation and universal revelation. There's a lot of bands that are able to write that song and it just seems like it gets everyone. Of course, there were a whole bunch of bands who did that in, you know, tracks that came out of the 70s and 80s. Like, this is multi-generational cla- that's, stuff. That's, yeah. that's half a classic rock's of course. main shtick. Yeah. Hell, I'll even give I'll even give it to bands like Boston and <laughs> things like that. Oh, they sure. were able to do it. Well, that's one of the reasons why I loved ACDC in concert when I saw them years ago is because they blew the roof off of Madison Square Garden. Yeah. And I mean, a- Angus Young, who's probably 100 years old at this point, played an 11-minute guitar solo. Yeah. Half I of get- it walking in a circle on the ground. Like, I mean, stuff like that. One wonders that maybe it's just attained that status from being on the radio for so many years and people hearing well, it everywhere... That maybe that's really what, in the end, gets you that universal appeal. It, I still think it's something intrinsic, though. It's it's uh, you never heard the echoes of Neil Young from underneath the Triborough Bridge. <laughs> it's something different, man. It's really it just hits a whole different level. Mm. But also, one thing I love about the smaller shows too is the singing along feels still more intimate. Like I mean, so it's, I've mentioned them a bunch of times, and which has probably something to do with the fact that I'm dating one of their members. But um. The Wasties, when they, they play a lot of cover songs, when the Way Station filled conflict with 50 interest, people... Conflict of interest. <laughs> when the Wasties are playing in the Way Station that's filled with 50 to 100 people, and they're all singing along to Safety Dance, and people are dancing in the room, there's just this level of fun that you don't get in a stadium show because... You can't if people are dancing. You can't. There's more tell. of a camaraderie, like in a, yes. in a, in a bar nightclub atmosphere yes. for sure. And I've experienced that. And let's t- switch genres for a second, uh, which will have to do with my next picks, uh, uh, the album for next week. Uh, jazz, jazz is something that is so can do. I it's almost impossible for you and me to, me to imagine it on a uh, on a grand stadium scale. Although it's done. And I know that it's done, and it's often done very well. It still feels like, in some ways, you lose the soul of what jazz really is. Jazz, oh, jazz started in the nightclub, and in many ways, I feel like no matter what you do, no matter how universal it is, it will always end there. It will always come back to your talking, your meeting to someone at a bar, and that light music is just playing in the background, just providing that that tone. It, it's romantic. Romantic what? is personal. Yeah. That's the other side of the dichotomy. Romantic, un- uh, personal, universal, romantic is personal. At the same time, we've talked about it before on air, arena rock. It's in the name. Of course. There's just rock that's designed for that. But speaking of jazz, um, there's this bar out in Santa Cruz, uh, California, for those of you that don't know where Santa Cruz is, that's called The Catalyst. I forget what it used to be called. This is a bar my dad went to growing up where he got to you know sit feet away from Neil Young, Crosby, Stills, Nash, the Eagles, and stuff like that in their early days, when before Woodstock, like, before classic rock became mainstream, um, before it was classic rock, 
And I went there. The cutting edge of rock. <laughs> it, I saw a jazz ska band, which had an incredible influ- infusion of the two elements of the bass work from uh, the newest type of uh, third wave ska with real old school jazz. And I have to say, I totally get that intimacy. Of course. It, I was three feet away from the stage. That's not even difficult to imagine, considering a lot of the instrumentation of ska comes from that big band swing atmosphere. That's very jazzy. Yeah, so, it was I'm three feet away. You're, I'm looking at eight, nine guys on stage. They're sweating balls underneath those lights. I've got a waitress who's just standing next to me because she stopped and listening to the music as well. Like yeah. It was just something different. But that leads itself to there's only there's some types of music are just always going to be more conducive to one setting over the others. Of course, and this is actually this is actually uh, <laughs> almost against my point because this is a very very popular jazz club. It goes back very many many years. But in New York City, there's a place called the Blue Note, uh, very well known place. It's a lot of esteemed jazz musicians have played there, and I was lucky enough to stumble in at some point uh, with a friend of mine, and we actually happened to just catch the private jazz band of, uh, I forget his name, but it's the, uh, it's the bassist who often functions as the, um, as the one-on-one with Jay Leno on The Tonight Show. Oh, um... You know him? Kevin something, I think. Yeah, we actually name. saw his jazz band play oh, there wow. at the Blue Note. And, of course, at the Blue Note, because it's so reputable, you're almost... It's almost the antithesis of the of the private jazz club, but it's still very private. Right. You get the atmosphere, you get everything for it. The only thing that's that's sacrificed, I guess, is a little bit of the. Uh, it's not personal. This wasn't for me. You know, it's very but, high high priced, but it's you still get it. But also, I I have to disagree a little bit with the intim- the um, what was it? The personal is romantic, because you can have. It's not that that's the only thing. I think that you can have that romantic moment even in a stadium. Because eventually it comes down to what the music means to you. And my example of this is, so, I've cried at emotional moments in concerts before. One of the first times it ever happened is I sing this band, Seven Dust, who typically plays mostly heavy metal music in a very small club. Well, actually, then it was small. They built it out, the Hammerstein Ballroom. And they played a song, they wrote this song called Angel's Son, which was dedicated to the lead singer of a band who had died very young. And they played it for the first time ever on stage acoustically, just the lead singer and the guitarist. And during the song, the lead singer starts to cry while singing. And you can hear it in his voice cracking. And I was hysterical. The person next to me was hysterical. Like, everybody felt the emotion of this song. Well, we've already always discussed you're a very emotional guy. You cry at the top of a hat. (laughs) A drop of a hat, excuse me. I'll take you more seriously when you learn to speak. But there was... I wouldn't. (laughs) It's on. The, the I had a moment very recently uh, when I went to see uh, Guster, Ben Folds, and Bare Naked Ladies. Did you well, cry during one week? No. I cried during Brick. When Ben Folds played Brick... I would. <laughs> I'll give you that. I was... I was... Tears streaming down my face. Cause, and it, this was That's a fairly nice. large crowd. Well, it's... Because it's such a sad song that it hits you on a level regardless of who's around you. I feel like you. you're moving away from what romantic is, though. And I'm going to be patient throughout the, all this because I was waiting to see, like, oh, well, maybe you were there with somebody or something like that. But it's... it's I feel like romantic... Like, that's emotional. I'm okay. not saying you can't get emotion on a, on a universal, large-scale uh, arena venue. I just feel like romantic is something that just by nature is between one and another okay. person. You it's know. exclusive. It's very exclusive. Okay. I had misunderstood what you meant. Yeah. Candlelight. We're talking about like that kind of thing. I think it's going to be very very hard for you to feel something personal, a personal connection that is original to you and maybe one other person when you're sitting at, a, at an arena Right, but those uh, little mini those little mini shows I was talking about that they did where B and L was playing before any bands went on by the the by the merch booth where there was just like fifty people standing around them that was romantic. Okay, fair enough. Because it was much more intimate because it was just them and a group of people. Fair enough. I, I romantic is not the right word, but personal connect collect the connection. I'm still incapable of speaking. Yeah, it's never gonna stop. At at um. What's the island under... I can't... I've been trying to think of it. Randall's this. Island. Thank you. Randall's Island. At Randall's Island, I saw Neil Young with my dad, and it was a great bonding experience for the two of us. 
and my brother. It was great. So you just, got a romantic connection. Not romantic, but personal well, connection. Per- but, but a one-on-one connection with people you were with at yeah. a large show. Yeah. Okay. And we were sitting so up it wasn't on a, a connection tree, with- like an eighth of a mile away from the stage. Like, we were far away from the stage, but they had to speak. So it was more of a connection with your peers than with the musician, which, okay, I can see that. Yeah, Yeah, that's still not exactly what I'm talking about, though. I mean... Personal connection? Communal. I think that's the really... A better word than universal. Universal sounds... So, communal is is you and maybe a small group or a multitude of individuals. That's what the arena-style concert is meant to convey, is that camaraderie, as I said. But when you're looking at, when you're comparing arena to the small venue, I feel like there's just something, there's just something missing. I think I understand. You feel like they're speaking to you. Yeah, a little bit more so. I've had that at large concerts. Uh, but how, they, how could you delude yourself possibly into thinking that? Just experiencing just the music. That's all I'm focusing on. You can ignore. I mean, it's level. It's levels of delusion, sure, because obviously no one's speaking to me directly within the uh, within the small scale venue Unless either. They're, you know, holding your hand, shaking. Well, it, that's not to true because right they ear. could be speaking Unless I'm directly. Unless scrolled out across the piano, but I mean, because like I said before, when I high fived Spider Zombie from um, Power Man Five Thousand, that was a moment between me and him. I high fived him. He gave me a thumbs up. Like that was a that very was awesome. intimate moment. Yeah, that was awesome. Um, but no, I mean, it's all how you're going to, it's, it's, I, I want to say it's less venue and more of the style of music and your connection to it. I think that, I think that I enjoy right. the larger context. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll half buy that. Okay. I don't know if you completely sold me yet, but. I, I like, all right. I think Good I enough. like the larger concerts versus the smaller concerts also for different reasons. Like the larger concerts are great with a group. You go with like 10 other people, you're in a row of seats, you're just rocking out. This say way. Say like you're going to Metallica, for example, and you're just way. rocking out, hanging out. Yeah, you get one person to go in the beer line for all of you so you don't miss the concert. Whereas in, at a small show, like at the Way Station, which is the small venue I, I frequent regularly, you get this intimate level with the artist that, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're with one or ten people. You're focusing on the artist. The thing is, I think you're foc- when you're in a smaller venue, you're focusing a lot closer on the way the music was meant to be in, at its conception. Yeah. Because obviously it wasn't written in front of a stage. Right. It wasn't written in front of the masses. It was written by a person or a small group of people, perhaps in a basement, perhaps in a small studio. Who perhaps knows? in a garage. Yes, perhaps in a... Perhaps in a backyard. <laughs> Let's keep going here. This is fun. Where, are there, where else can you record? It's fun. In a get, subway station? Not really. Maybe I, in a bathroom? I don't know. Actually, when you're didn't you pot? show me a video of someone who recorded in a bathroom? Yes, Licky Lee. Licky oh, that Lee, wasn't right. a record. That, I don't think she wrote it there, but that was a, a, a stylistic um, uh, music video. Yeah, where for they Using were in the, the acoustics of, of the bathroom. The bathroom. Which, okay. which is why I always sound best in the bathroom. No, that's because no one else can hear you. And I can't. Oh! Well, their screens are not getting in the way. I think we're getting kind of meandering on the topic, but I mean, anyway, it's just kind yeah. of nice. Like, it leads me back to the thing that we you always mock me and say that everyone listens to music differently. I think everyone experiences concerts very differently also. On a person-to-person level, it's very different. Because I know plenty of people who prefer the stadium shows, whereas I think I may prefer the smaller shows. Well, here's, I, a, here's another thing. Let's get off the whole personal connection, first of all. Let's talk about pure cold logistics. When you're looking at a concert, there's a lot, like a big concert, an arena concert, there's a lot more room, I think, for stuff to go wrong. For instance, it's crowded, uh, there's a lot more, you know, it's pyrotechnics, there's a lot of other stuff that needs to go into a, uh, an arena level concert. And a lot, a lot of times people. that can ruin, even if you think you're about to establish a pers- personal connection, it could ruin the potential for it. There's also a lot more people that can piss you off, and that's usually the detractor yeah. at concerts. Yeah. Is the other listener. And I don't always like when everybody sings along. Sometimes, I mean, you know, not everyone enjoys that kind of thing. I love it. I Some, it love depends it. on the lyric, it depends on the song, it depends on the band. But sometimes I'm just not always into it. Sometimes I just want to hear the music. Well, also about the smaller shows, there's kind of a more real feel to it. For example, when something goes wrong, wrong at a large-scale show, like a amp drops out or a mic breaks... It's a lot of fluster and flubbing and to get everything back on track. You have a team working for you. Right. That's Whereas thing. if you're at a local show and the lead singer's guitar string snaps, they either keep playing and laugh about it or they stop, crack a joke. Like, it's it's more like, hey, 
this happened and it's ridiculous, but we're all in on it. Let's laugh about this it. This might be of another problem, and I mentioned this two weeks ago when we were talking about our, our best and worst concert experiences. The most recent time I saw KO Dot, issues, major issues with uh, uh, one person's cord just stopped working. They didn't have feed anymore, didn't have a replacement cord, so they had to move microphones around. It was all very, you know, haphazard and everything. I'm not saying that that directly... Uh, contributed to the worst concert experience but again it's one in a series of many no fault of their own right. it's just the the logistics yet again um and like i said that also had to do with the people playing in the adjacent uh nightclub so right you know you have those those things to deal with small concert venues as well i'm sorry steve that's uh, okay can always be the great and remember best concert experience also ko dot 2007 slightly bigger than uh, there you go. Levels of small venues. You you can't just lump, you know, arenas and small little nightclubs together. There's levels in there. I actually one of my favorites is really the whole Bowery Ballroom type place. And there's a there's a series of those around New York City. Yeah, Hammerstein Ballroom. Yeah. The, the Ballroom. Starland exactly. Ballroom in Jersey, yeah. yeah. Those are really my favorite type of venue, personally. You can... It's not too big, but it's not too small. It's kind of that middle ground. Right. It also has some very interesting acoustics for a lot of different styles of music. So you can listen to a huge variety in those without really losing anything. Yeah, Webster Hall, and Irving Plaza. I'll, Sorry, I'll I'm still naming Devil's venues. Advocate on myself right now because I've been to a lot of just jump genres again, classical. I've been to a lot of classical recitals in my life, and a lot of these classical recitals. Huge halls, no? <laughs> recitals are not huge halls. Recitals can be in very, very close. You know, I've also been like college things. Oh, okay. college things. We're talking high but, school auditorium. No, not necessarily. <laughs> in college, first of all, colleges are able to get a lot of fairly big names to visit yeah, colleges, so they're still like small recital halls. As also um, places in the city, like for instance, at the place that I saw Ko Dot the first time I was there at Spectrum, New York. Uh, okay. It's over in the Lower East Side. That's primarily contemporary classical stuff. So that's just like a, a guy's apartment that he converted into a venue. That's very recital hall venue. The problems, as I started to say, with that is that you feel so constricted. If you were even slight bit claustrophobic, because you usually have those chairs that are really close together. Not that that was particularly the case in this instance of Spectrum, because there was like couches and beanbag chairs. But in many of these, they're very tightly knit, and you feel like you're unable to even breathe without disturbing the person next to you, let alone cough or sneeze or get up to go to the bathroom and yeah. make a whole row get up. There's just logistics like that you can't escape from. You almost wish you were at an arena for those stages. Like, if you were seeing a huge named classical composer, then I think I might actually prefer a larger venue. So a place where I could at least just, you know, work it out. <laughs> right. No, and I then totally... come back refreshed and focused again I, rather I... than holding it all in. I totally understand. I, when I saw Shay for the Dark Lord, a nerdcore rapper, in Brooklyn, it was in this space that was essentially a, a warehouse space converted, this small a room no bigger than the room we're recording in, converted to have a stage. But the stage was a small platform in the corner, but pretty much when the artists, all of the rappers had performed, they're pretty much standing right in front of you and everyone's surrounding them and by the time like the main bands came on which were Shea for the Dark Lord and Jesse Dangerously like the place was packed and like I'm bobbing and singing along because I like Shea for the Dark Lord know a lot of his songs same with Jesse but you know it's one of those things where you're bobbing and moving and you're elbowing the guy next to you and you don't mm -hmm. need to because you're so crammed in you know something like that where there's such high energy because those performers perform with a very high energy it's kind of hard to be in a small room like that. Well, yeah. there's also the fact that the owners of these places tend to ignore things like maximum capacities and stuff like that. I well, there's, feel there's some, there's some, and they have no control over their adjacent buildings. You're exactly. Not gonna have, you're not going to have issues with soundproofing in MSG. What is the office building next to you going to be making more noise than MSG? Yeah. I don't think so. Yeah. yeah, and then there's like, you can't do recital halls for rock and roll because you just can't mm. rock. Tends to be just too loud. I used to think for the room. I used to think otherwise, but based on my experience uh, this summer with Ko Dot, I'm inclined to agree. Hip hop rap is another thing. You do need a larger space for it because of the, just the way it's. It's mixed. a high energy, and yeah, the mix, and no, I agree. Yeah. Mm. Also, you like still get intimacy, but well, it's, for also actually, I can, I can make a comparison. So I saw Corn years and years ago at MSG 
when they were playing on the Family Values tour. It's when Linkin Park first came out and the Biscuit first came out, so they were really huge then. And they all played this huge stadium. And it was great. It was a lot of fun. And then a couple of years ago, they were playing this small venue, Starland Ballroom in Jersey. And me and my friend Neil, who I mentioned earlier, were like, oh, Corn's playing local in a small venue? Let's go see him. You know, it'll be a small venue. It'll be great. It was awful. Yeah, I could have told you that. Because we got there. First of all, we we didn't even go for the opening act because we didn't care. We just wanted to see Corn. By the time we got there, the place was so packed. It was yep. elbow to elbow. You couldn't get anywhere. Corn went on an hour late. They left early. There was no encore. It was the most miserable experience of my life. It sometimes feels like a bit of a... Well, the... It actually sounds a little bit similar to my Care Dot experience. The, the funny thing, of course, that was a festival, so, well, a mini festival. So there were a row of musicians who really had time slots. So in many ways, I knew I wasn't going to get a, an encore necessarily. I went into it kind of expecting that. Yeah. But yes, it does seem to be the case that you sacrifice a lot of that stuff with smaller venues. It depends on that, the band, I think. Right. That that's being what said, it really comes down that's to. not the case at ballroom style venues. Ballroom yeah. style venues, you will get. You'll get your opening act, and you'll get a nice full length of the feature, as well as an encore, maybe even two. And that's one of the things, also, I want to mention about the concert experience before we wrap it up. I love discovering new bands at concerts. It's one of my favorite things. Yes, I have discovered quite a few. The, one uh, of the biggest uh, bands, one of the, not biggest, but one of the bands that caught me off guard that I liked is this band called Old Man Markley. They're kind of a folky Irish band, and... And they're really a lot of fun, and they're really great. But I saw them open for No Effects, a well-known punk band. It was such a dichotomy, and so kind of caught me off guard when the band walks out on stage, and one guy's got a washboard around his neck. I'm like, what? (laughs) But I liked them because they were high energy, a lot of fun, and completely unexpected. And I love when stuff like that happens. mm, I will say that is is a great thing, but in my experience, uh, if the discovered band the band you're seeing that is not what you're going there to see for the opening acts if they're not the same type of music than what you're gonna go see a lot of times they get shafted oh good thing for um for mentioning that but what do you mean when you say they get shafted they're using the same acoustics the headliner's gonna be using they're using the same speakers and everything like that the headliner's using and the headliner may be a punk band while they're more of a country rock, and they may be better than well, the headline. I've also noticed that sometimes the people who plan these concerts don't always really take into account, like, the audience. Usually. Usually they do. But sometimes, uh, there's been some really off ones. The first time I saw Gogo Bordello way back in, like, 2006, uh, was in one of these uh, ballroom-style venues, and there were two opening acts, the first of which was a band called Thor. Now, just imagine what that band probably is. Probably just metal. Yes. Probably metal. Probably, probably, huh? They probably have hammers. It it was a bunch of guys dressed like Vikings, playing super loud, jumping off the PA system into the audience. It seemed to be the antithesis of what I hear in Gogo Bordello. Well, not the antithesis. Well, also, what you have to remember is sometimes bands bring everybody on tour. Like the Bare Naked Ladies concert I saw recently, Guster and Ben Folds were with them on tour. They were all similar because they were all traveling together. Some of these venues... They just, anyone who wants a gig, they hire them to get a band in to open for an act that's coming through by themselves. And sometimes the the, the venue owners just want to get someone in. The only thing the two seem to have in common was their being intense, maybe? (laughs) Or, like, how many ways could you possibly do intense? They had instruments. Don't forget that And they were human. There you go. (laughs) Never never seen any animal bands. Uh, (laughs) But, uh, but yeah, no, I... I, I like discovering new acts at concerts, especially when, especially when in closing, like it just it lends to that kind of experience where you you feel even closer to a band when you first discovered them at this show, and if they're not the headliner, you usually get to chat with them after. That's how I became very close with Patent Pending, who were a lot of fun, is because I discovered them at a uh, Bowling for Soup concert, and they had the same kind of fun, interactive style as Bowling for Soup. In fact, most interesting concert moment. The lead singer, Joe, of, of um, Patent Pending, before they went on stage, he came out and said, Hi, I'm Joe. Who are you? Hi, I'm the entire crowd. All like 100, 150 people were there. That's he introduced nice. himself to everybody. And then afterwards, still took photos with people. It was just one of those things where it was kind of nice. It was an intimate moment that I wasn't expecting. That's pretty nice. Also, if you're ever lucky enough to get a VIP pass in some of these concerts, that's a whole nother thing. 
because you get a VIP pass, you get to actually meet the band, you get to actually go upstairs, I actually got to do that at the Beacon, go up to like the seventh floor to meet the band Rat Dog, which is the offshoot of the former Grateful Dead. Right. I got to meet members who were it, it, former associates or, you know, add-ons to the Grateful Dead. That's pretty intense. Yeah. So I felt, you know, I had a beer with them and everything like that. That's awesome. That's, you know. That's the moments a, like that that are... So for sure, intimate connections can be achieved. I guess that's what we've taken away here today. So, uh, what's our uh, spam of this week, Steve? Our spam this week is... My in the mind contains number. You do. Shu sees. It's teachings. In fact, his in the mind is a point also to have... No. By MK Outlet. What? Did you follow that, John? He's thinking. This, this could take a while. A, re- a reread. I'm trying to count the prepositions. In fact, his in the mind is a point to also have no. No what? No, that's that's no. That's that's uh, negative. I know. The dead air is him thinking. No uh, what? Bear with audience. No bear what? with. Like what? No what? Moving on, what's our pick for next week, Steve? It's your choice. As I said earlier, we're going to dive into a different genre next week. We're diving into jazz. Fun. And I'm going to start the same way we started when I've introduced other genres, by putting out a fairly big name in the industry. Uh, big band, a big industry in the name of Ambient was Boards of Canada. This week, big industry, big, big name in the, the name of the industry, jazz, is Chick Corea. Chick Corea is a very, 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 very well-known pianist. And his new album will be coming out tomorrow as of this podcast, so it will be available next week. So I'm catching this bright and early. The album's called The Vigil, and I have no idea what to expect because, let's face it, this guy's kind of old. His, his days of jazzing around were back in the 60s and 70s in the golden age of the jazz revival of that era. So who knows? Should be interesting, at least. Let's just put it this way. He's he's a virtuoso. And I don't think we've had very many virtuosos, or at least known as virtuosos, in individuals, at least. So, this is a new thing. All right. Well, on that note, and in wrapping up, as always, music is life, and, and life, life is, is good. good.